was Johnny. They're all gonna laugh at you. They're all gonna laugh at you. Get away from her, you bitch. We all go a little mad sometimes. Haven't you? Let's face it, baby. These days, you gotta have a sequel. You fly back to school now, little Starling. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Once Upon a Nightmare. As always, I am your host Lorraine Purden and I'm here to discuss the horrors of the world, both fictional and real. This week, it's going to be my final film for John Carpenter Month. I did cover Halloween in the month before this one, which was September. (laughs) And for this month, I did The Thing with Ray from Being Bookish. I did Village of the Damned. I did The Fog with Stuart from British Murders. And last week I covered Christine, and this week I am going all the way back to 1998, and this is Vampires. Have you ever seen a vampire? Forget whatever you've seen in the movies. It's not like they're seducing everybody in sight with cheesy Euro trash accents, all right? They don't turn into bats. Crosses don't work. You want to kill one? You drive a wooden stake right through his heart. We think we got a nest inside this place. And chances are we'll find a master in here somewhere. I know your parents were bitten by vampires and you were raised by the church to be its master slayer. No one knows vampires better than he does. Oh my baby. But he met his match when he met the master who started it all. Jack Crow. He was a priest. It's the first known case of vampirism. The first and most powerful. You are the only one who faced Alec and survived. A master vampire has a telepathic link with his victims. (laughs) You're gonna help us find them. It's a cross. For 600 years, Valak has wanted to live in the daylight. A master vampire able to walk in the sun, unstoppable. Biggest nest of blood-drinking mothers the world has ever known. Time to kill some vampires. Vampires is loosely based on the 1992 book of the same name by John Stakely. That is a great surname for this topic. The screenplay was by Don Jacoby. It stars James Woods as the leader of a group of vampire hunters, Jack Crow, who are all working for the Catholic Church. Crow himself was the victim of vampires as his father was bitten and eventually he could not control his thirst for blood and killed his mother. So he killed his father. Not exactly the best start. After nearly all of his team are brutally murdered by master vampire Jan Velik, played by Thomas Ian Griffith, you may recognise him as Terry Silver from The Karate Kid and Cobra Kai. Crow then makes it his mission to hunt Velik and destroy him. An ancient Catholic relic is wanted by Velek to enable him to become a daywalker. You don't want that. Crow, along with team survivor Anthony Montoya, played by Daniel Baldwin, Katrina, a woman infected by Velek, played by Cheryl Lee, and Father Adam Gatou, played by Tim Guinea, work together to locate Velek before he completes a ritual to protect him against the sunlight. Out of all the John Carpenter films I've covered, I think this is by far the most violent and gory. But having said that, it wasn't over the top. And I'm not going to lie, while I was a bit grossed out with some of it, I didn't really have to look away, which is always a bonus for me. It's an 18. I am totally on board with that. It had a budget of about 20 million and it only made that at the box office, but it was said to have apparently doubled. One vibe that this film definitely does give you is Western. It is a massive Western film that just happens to be about vampires. Carpenter said he has taken from Westerns here more than horror, and he drew from people like Sam Peckinpah and Howard Hawks. I do enjoy the whole concept of the vampire hunter. For example, Blade, which I covered back in episode eight. My God, that was a long time ago. And Blade is actually one of my favorite films. It's definitely up there. And it came out the same time as this film. And I did see this film when it came out, but I didn't remember a lot of it. And we, of course, have ones like Buffy. She's a hunter, but I was never massively into the whole Buffy thing. I did see the film, but I didn't watch the TV program. But we also have other vampire movies, 
you know, that people that are just trying to survive the situation, they're not really prepared like what we see here in this film. 30 Days a Night, cover that in episode 105. It's basically a massacre, an unexpected attack. They just hope they make it through without being killed. But this movie, it's more about the hunters than the vampires. One thing that's very different here compared to a lot of other films we see is there is a big team. The team here is very prepared for them. They are actually going out to hunt them. They are going to their lair, their humble abodes. Obviously, sunlight, big no-no for vampires. So hunting during the day, it makes more sense. And these guys have an arsenal of weapons and quite a large number of mercenary-esque men to destroy all these vampires. It kind of reminds me of the Expendables before the Expendables became the Expendables. But what it does do is straight off the bat, show us what we're in for, shows us what these hunters are actually capable of. And they're good at their job. So the opening credits are stunning. We see names roll over this blood red orange sky, soaring over the desert and mountains. We then land on this kind of rundown house in the middle of nowhere. And this is the place where the attack on the vampires will happen. But it is also an attack that these hunters will soon regret. The way they kill the vampires, I get it, but it's so brutal. And you can see that these hunters feel nothing as they do it. Again, these vampires would not think twice about brutally killing you, but the way they are dragged into the sunlight, screaming and bursting into flames, it's pretty barbaric. The one that stands out the most for me in this whole thing, because obviously a load of them have gone into the house to kind of get these um vampires, they put a stake in them, they kind of get dragged out and the sun kills them. And that is Montoya Daniel Baldwin. He just doesn't give a shit. It's just another day at the office for him. And to be fair, the position though that he has within the team, if I was working for these guys, it's the one I'd want. He's the guy that gets to stay outside and reel them in and bring them into the light. So for me, Baldwin here was a good choice. And it actually turned out his brother, Alec, who is kind of the most famous Baldwin brother, was up for the role, but he couldn't do it. And he suggested his brother. They do look very similar. And to be honest, he's actually kind of one of my favorites in this film. One, not the, but one. He is the one I feel we get to see a few different sides to, which I will go into in a bit. So obviously to get the vampires out, they have to go within this house. But the thing with this is while they're on the outside in the daylight, they're protected. When they go in, these hunters, they're not really pr protected. Despite the weapons and manpower, they're now inside the vampire territory. They do what they can to make some more extra light, so they're pulling boards off the windows to let that sunlight in. The job they do show, shows these guys have some serious balls. They're so close to being killed by one of these things at any particular time, and they just go in and do it. Now, to go in here, they're basically going after this one guy, Valak, as, as I've mentioned, and it doesn't really go according to plan, and there's a massive consequence for this. But this consequence happens on their territory, and they end up becoming a victim. They're having this party in a motel room, and it's a party that you would not want to be at. It's very sleazy, and Valak makes an appearance, and this kind of shows you how strong he is, what he's capable of, how he doesn't give a shit, and he's not afraid of anyone. So he's a very old vampire. He's 600 years old. He was born in Prague in 1311, and was a Catholic priest who turned against the church. They said he was possessed by demons, which of course that's what you would be if you turned against the church. I'm only joking, I'm not religious. And uh, he was taken to France where an exorcism was performed. Apparently it wasn't exactly by the book and it was forbidden, but they went ahead with it anyway, because why not? And as it didn't go according to plan, the exorcism was referred to as an inverse exorcism. And this is when dark powers come and claim the possessed soul. I'd never heard of that term before. And if I had, I don't remember. Valak would be tried for heresy and then burned at the stake. This would not exactly work as the soul remained, but Valak isn't one to let a little bit of fire keep him down. He was up and about in no time, strolling the streets at night, feeding on the blood of any poor human that got in his way. He was known as the first vampire. 
Valak is a very powerful vampire, but he wants one thing he does not have. He wants to be able to walk about in the daylight. I don't know why I hate the sun. This is where the Black Cross of Beziers comes into play. If Valak finds this, he can complete the ritual from 600 years ago and finally become a daywalker. But without the ability to be in the daylight, we still have a very strong vampire. When he descends upon the motel, he has no fear. He does not care that he is outnumbered, and he's outnumbered a lot. He simply knocks on the door and slices the person who answers it in half. He has very sharp nails. I wonder though, is that the hole because he knocked on the door and they opened it? Does that mean he's invited? We've all watched The Lost Boys where he goes, I'm not coming in until you invite me. He goes, you're invited. So maybe that's what it is. I don't know. We see the violence here. It's not simply a bite to the neck, but he can stab through your body with a punch. He also uses people as weapons and shields when someone's shooting at him, when someone's getting in his way. It is very clear in this scene that this guy is not going to be very easy to kill. But before all this goes down, he then gets it on with Katrina, giving her a little nibble on the thigh, but he doesn't kill her. She's now attached to him and they keep her after he's gone and she survived. And she's like some sort of like tracking device. She can see what he's up to. After the massacre, there are only three left. We have Crow, Montoya and Katrina. Montoya, as I mentioned, has different sides and is a confusing character. When we see him ruling in the vampires, he appears to not have a care in the world. Like he just doesn't care, give a shit. When we see him with Katrina, it can be really disturbing. We find her tied to a bed in a hotel room, naked, and that's not something you want to see. But he says it's like for her own good. He's cleaned her up and tied her down in case she turns. But why does he have to leave her naked? Then she bites him, he slaps her. Now, slapping a woman, slapping anyone for that matter, is obviously, you know, it makes you a cowardly piece of shit. But she's just bitten him after trying to jump off the building. So he slaps her and roughs her up. And if a vampire bit me, I'd probably be a bit pissed. But also, after she's bit him, he does this thing, which I've never seen before, or I don't recall ever seeing before. He burns the bite does he, does it slow it down? Does he think this will prevent him from turning into a vampire? It was very bizarre. So at this stage with Montoya, you're, you're kind of unsure about him because I get why he hit her away and I get why he does what he does with the vampires. But towards the end of the film, you kind of see this completely different side to him where he shows that he actually kind of cares about this woman I feel he is someone who just does what he needs to do. And so hitting a vampire, I get it, no matter the gender. All that we see in the film with Katrina, apparently that didn't go down too well. The press released that they weren't very happy about it, about the way she's treated by Montoya and also Crow. I'll be honest, while I'm not a fan of how she is treated, it would appear, especially with Crow, in a really strange way and a very messed up way, he kind of treats everyone the same. He pretty much mistreats anyone that comes in his path. And this is kind of the same with Montoya. They kind of just get on with it. So the abuse towards Katrina in this film, apart from the naked bit that I didn't like, it kind of feels like it wasn't about a man abusing a woman. They just abuse anybody, really. Crow is a bit different, though, in the sense that he just seems so angry all the time. I guess this is personal, but... He doesn't ever really give anyone a chance to speak, to respond. He's either shouting you down or hitting you, one or the other. And the other character that we don't overly focus on but should is Father Adam. I don't feel he really understands what he's getting into. He's young and just wants to be part of something. The older priest has died that we see at the beginning and he takes his place. He gets treated so badly by Crow. Crow is a massive bully when it comes to Adam. And I get Crow feels he's been betrayed in some sort of way. First, the massacre of his friends, but also the fact that Valak knew his name. So he's kind of wondering, how is this possible? So who can he trust? But I get that while there's not a lot of focus on Adam, I suppose that's because all the focus is on Crow. He's an interesting one, obviously the main character of the movie. I am a fan of Woods, so I think he's a great actor. And the role is the typical kind of action guy, no fear, a certain way of talking, no problem speaking their mind. And up until then, you wouldn't have really seen James Woods as an action star. He wasn't an obvious choice 
this type of role. And apparently Carpenter said that's why he cast him. The audience were not used to seeing him in this type of role. He isn't physically a strong looking character like the Stallones or the Schwarzeneggers and Snipes of the world, but he knows how to do this job. And I don't think he necessarily needs to have that like physical strength or that big physical presence. He has a passion for this because of what happened to his family. And he is very smart. He also has that overreacting thing you see, though. He's very aggressive, both verbally and physically. But having said that, when it comes to his work, the whole thing is an operation. It isn't just a bunch of people going all gung-ho and seeing what happens. There is a plan to it. There is a way to do it to get the best possible result. You don't really get that dick measuring thing going on here, especially at the start when the whole team is there. Everyone has a job to do. Crow is a strong character because of his thinking process, and this is what keeps him alive. It's like he knows what he does, and he does that. He does it well. He's a good leader. So when his crew is gone, he knows what he has to do. He doesn't have the backup of a group, but time isn't on his side. He has to sort this out with the master vampire before he becomes a daywalker and causes even more havoc. The Cardinal, who is played by Maximilian Schell, tries to get Crow to form a new team. He's the one who gives him Father Adam. But getting the right people, this is going to take a while. And Valak isn't slowing down. This is why Crow needs to just go ahead with the small team he has. But you think here Valak is the bad guy. No. Well, he's one of them. But the Cardinal, he is the worst. So he's in on it. He wants to help Valak. And... To do this, they have to capture Crow because he knows that Crow could take them down. And they do. But it's Adam. thats He's the one that steps up. He's the one that kind of saves the day for everyone. But this whole interaction when Crow is captured, it just shows how he doesn't give a shit. He has a goal and it is to take them down. And whether he's standing with a crossbow or tied to a cross, he still does the same thing. And I love how Crow speaks to Valak when he's caught. He wants to fight him. He's taunting him. And it's quite funny how he says it. This is where I don't think it would have worked well with other action stars like uh, the Stallones and Schwarzeneggers of the world. I don't think they would have been as quick with the responses the way Woods was. And Carpenter does explain how that's just how James Wood is. And you kind of have to just go with it. And he said he came up with some really good stuff and not so good stuff. But Carpenter said he really enjoyed working with him. Like, I like the way when he's taunting Vilek, how he turns around and says, look, and after you're finished, you can even bite my ass a little. <laughs> it's quite funny. But like any baddies in films, Vilek and the Cardinal, they got too cocky. They think they're above everyone else and they will get what they want. It never even occurs to Vilek that he will lose against Crow. Whereas Crow knows what he's up against and he knows he could die, but he also has a job to do. He has no weapons and with no weapons, Crow doesn't really stand a chance against Velek, but he'd have more of a chance if he wasn't tied to a cross. This is where Adam comes in. But Velek doesn't take the bait when he's taunted him to fight. He doesn't bite. He has one thing to achieve and he has no interest in indulging Crow in these games. Father Adam really steps up here. He becomes more and more brave and willing to do the things he probably never thought he would have to. As they hunt vampires, he's willing to go inside the buildings to lure them out. He's willing to trust Crow, despite the despicable way he was treated by him all along. He's willing to do what needs to be done. And by the end of it, he becomes the one that saves the day. And Valak and his cockiness and the Cardinal and his cockiness means they don't survive. Again, Crow and his crew were successful, even though there was only three of them. The sunlight, it gets Valak in the end you got to be smart, Velek. Crow's been doing this for a very long time. But as we know, Katrina and Montoya, they have been bitten. And out of the fact that they've been friends for a while, Crow gives them a head start. He knows what they're going to turn into, but he lets them go. But he is going to be hunting them. So this is the end bit where it kind of gets a bit sad for me and how we see Montoya be someone is kind of caring and how he wants to be, and he wants to be like this good man for Katrina. I feel like he really likes her towards the end and he's taken her off. So yeah, we see a lot of uh, growth with him. Like Crow by the end of it is exactly the same. I mean, he's doing his friend a, a favor, but he's kind of exactly the same. Adam, we see Grow become stronger, become braver. 
and Montoya we see kind of being this guy who doesn't really give a shit but then all you know he starts to care about this woman so we see growth with him and we see growth with Adam we don't really see any growth with Crow he's still the same guy but overall I like this movie it's fun it's over the top in parts and just the right amount of blood and violence I love the use of colour gave me all the autumnal vibes with the use of orange the reds the browns I love the cheesy one-liners the way Valek just glides into whatever situation he is in while Crow tells Adam about how these vampires, they're not romantic. He gives this big speech about, you know, it's not what you see in the movies. I felt Valek, maybe more because of his look, was a bit romantic. A little more stabby and slashy than I would like in a vampire, should I meet one. But I felt he got the look down, the old look down. And I do love the way his long coat just like flaps behind him as he's walking. A bit like how we see... Uh, what's his name? Nicholas Cage in Face Off as he's walking to the aeroplane. Love that shot. And I also had someone to root for. I rooted for Adam. He became the winner in this movie for me. And he was my favourite. I could have accepted anyone else dying, but I wanted him to survive. And he does. I needed that. And that is my little take on vampires. And that is the end of my John Carpenter month. I would like to say thank you for listening and don't forget to rate and review on Apple, Spotify and Podchaser. And if you want any behind the scenes, you can go follow me on Instagram as Once Upon a Nightmare Podcast, on Threads as Once Upon a Nightmare Podcast, on Facebook as Once Upon a Nightmare, or you can email me as Once Upon a Nightmare Pod at gmail.com. Again, thanks for listening. Take care and I will chat to you soon. Bye.